Welcome to Charlotte Motor Speedway as Jefferson Pilot Teleproductions presents exclusive coverage of the Winston. 12 of NASCAR's winning drivers of 1984 going at it head to head for half a million dollars. In the early 1960s, the race cars here were almost right off the showroom floor and the purses were practically peanuts. A lot's happened in 25 years. Charlotte's become the showplace of stock car racing. And today, the sport's best will square off and chase half a million dollars and this race car, Bill Elliott's Ford Thunderbird. It'll be a classic Ford versus Chevrolet confrontation. And everyone in the garage area is talking about the slow-talking, fast-driving Georgian Bill Elliott. Fans in the stand want to see a Chevrolet Ford battle like they saw years ago. It's a natural thing. It's like Coke and Pepsi. Well, the biggest thing is he's got a, a big advantage with the smallest car. I don't believe there's a secret. I think we've just got our combination together as far as driver and the chassis working well. If he runs as good as he can run all day and has no problems, then we don't have a very good chance of beating him. It's the Ford race car doesn't really belong in the garage area with the other race cars in here. The Thunderbird doesn't. It's a tremendous advantage over GM products. Uh, NASCAR has got to do something about it to make it more competitive. At this point in time, I really feel that the cars are pretty much equal. So while crew chiefs look for more horsepower, and drivers like Richard Petty and Terry Labonte strap in for more practice, the man whose car is at the eye of the storm of controversy works on his chassis, and waits. Welcome to Charlotte Motor Speedway as Jefferson Pilot Teleproductions presents exclusive coverage of the 1985 Winston. 12 of NASCAR's top drivers going for $500,000. Today's show is brought to you by Coors. Stock up now on the cold, refreshing taste of Coors where you buy beer. Coors to you. Buy Skull Bandits for tobacco pleasure without lighting up. It's the little pouch of tobacco pleasure. By the STP Corporation. On the world's racetracks, on the world's roads. Depend on STP. And by Goodyear, makers of the high-performance radio, the Eagle. It's a beautiful day at Charlotte Motor Speedway. 76 degrees, mostly sunny skies. Little breeze blowing. Keep these race fans a little cool as they watch some hot competition. The Winston is a unique event in stock car racing. It's just 70 laps. It's worth half a million dollars. To keep the competition fierce up front, there's two bonus laps, 20 and 55, that pay $10,000 to the leader of those laps. And unlike the Bush Clash, another NASCAR sprint-type race, there will be one mandatory pit stop. That'll have a lot to do with race strategy and the outcome of today's event. Hello, everyone. Hi atop the Charlotte Motor Speedway. I'm Mike Joy, and with me will be a couple of fellas that have a unique perspective on this event. One is Kyle Petty, who's done just about everything he can to qualify for the Winston, but get to victory lane. You've come close this year, though. Yeah, we've come close real close a couple of times, and, uh, you know, things have been going real well for us. So hopefully before the end of the year, we'll be able to, to win a race or two and maybe start up front in the Winston next year. It's said that this is a Ford racetrack, and certainly everyone's been chasing Bill Elliott on the Super Speedways this year. You've had some real good runs, and it looks like your car is pretty well set up for Sunday's World 600 here. We hope it's set up for this World 600. Uh, you know, the racetrack here in Charlotte is suited for the Fords. The racetrack gets real slick getting in the corner. It gets real slick getting out. And the Ford motor seems to really help it pull up off the corner. It seems to be able to get down and get a little bit more coming up off. And, uh, you know, the car seems to stay real tight. So hopefully it'll be that way tomorrow, too. Usually race week, there's a lot of pitting and kidding going on in the garage area. But things have been kind of serious down there this week. Definitely so. This is uh, one of the few times I've ever been to a racetrack when it seems like it's another Daytona 500, you know. When you come to the racetrack and you're running for as much money as we run for in the 600 and running for as much money as these guys are running for in the Winston, I mean, you know, there's got to be a lot of pressure on the crews to get two cars ready, the pressure on the drivers to run two races in a row and to perform to the peak of their ability. Where on this racetrack is the Ford most superior to the Chevrolet's? Well, like I said before, it's a, it's a little bit better getting in the corner because of the sloped rear glass. Uh, the car seems to handle a little bit better. It seems to take a set a little bit sooner. Coming up off of the corner, the car is real suited to the racetrack as far as the torque range and the horsepower of the motor. The torque range is a little bit lower and it can get down. Like I say, it reaches for another gear almost like overdrive and begins to come up off the corner. This will be a Ford Chevrolet battle here this afternoon, and we'll also get the perspective later on from Neil Bonnet, Chevrolet driver, who won't be in the Winston today. He's already qualified for next year's running of this prestigious event. 
On pit row, there'll be three gentlemen, each with unique viewpoints on this race. Johnny Hayes is the former owner of the Copenhagen Skoll Racing Team. For brothers Phil and Benny Parsons, the drivers, he'll be with us on pit road today. Johnny? Thank you, Mike. I tell you, folks, the first thing I got to say is if you missed today, you probably missed about the most exciting moment in motorsports. We got about 130,000 people here, and everybody's so excited. I got cold chills. I know what these drivers are going through. I know what they're thinking about. Bill Elliott's probably one of my best friends. We've been together a long time, and I knew him before he hit the big time. He's made a lot of money. He's won a bunch of races, but he ain't having no fun. The pressure is is awesome. A lot of things people don't know about Bill Elliott is he's his own crew chief. He's not like these other guys. They can walk out, jump in their race car and go. Bill Elliott was at the racetrack this morning at 5.30. He'll have a long day and he's got a long day tomorrow. I tell you, it's so exciting. I just hope you all enjoy it and have a great day. Back to you, Mike. You've heard the sound of stock cars in the background. They've been running the Win Dixie 300 late model sportsman race, which you may see on tape delay on many of these same stations. Neil Bonnet competed in that race. That's why he's not with us now. And after his second place finish behind Tim Richmond, he'll be up with us shortly. On pit road, a gentleman who's covered the races for ESPN, all forms of motorsports from pit road, from the broadcast booth. Let's join Larry Newber. Thanks, Mike. Well, the late model sportsman race has just concluded, and Tim Richmond has won a smashing victory here. He was fast all week long in this division, and he was very fast today. You know, this weekend is the day and date of a lot of races around the country, and almost all of them are extra distance races, and pit stops become a very big part of the strategy. Well, this is something just a little different for all the Grand National stock car teams. As Mike mentioned to you, there is one required pit stop. It's about halfway through the race. Now, during that pit stop, you have to change outside or right side rubber, whether you want to or not, or whether you've already stopped or not already in this race. Also, these cars are equipped to go just a little more than halfway through this race in terms of a full load of fuel. So during that pit stop, the question becomes, how much fuel do you put in? You have to start with a full load because of weight restrictions. But depending upon how well the gas mileage has been up to that point, you might not want to fill up just at that time at that last pit stop, or rather that required pit stop. Well, that's the strategy from down here in the pits. The pit crews have never seen anything quite like this here at Charlotte this weekend. Now, Kyle, a word about Tim Richmond. He has his work cut out for him this weekend. He just finished the sportsman race. He'll run in the Winston, a 100-mile test. And then Sunday, he takes on the World 600, the longest race on the NASCAR circuit. He and Bobby Allison are the only drivers doing triple duty. And I think about Sunday late in the day, that's going to wear on them. Well, hopefully it'll wear on them. You know, from where I'm standing, I hope so. But, uh, you know, if Richmond and and, uh, and I guess Bobby do, both do the same deal, then they'll end up running over 1,000 miles in one weekend. And, uh, you know, the World 600 is a tough race on everybody, even if you only have to run those 600 miles, not counting the 400 they're having to run today. Well, 1,000 miles plus practice on three different race cars makes for a long week here. And it's been a long week for you folks here. You came in, what, Tuesday? Yeah, we came in Tuesday, you know, and, and tried to get everything set up. And uh, the weather's been real bad here. You know, it's been real cloudy all week and everything's been changed. And the last practice they had for the Winstons yesterday was real cool. I think it was 30 or 40 degrees. The guys have set the cars up for that type of weather and now it's 70 or 80 today. So, uh, you know, the track's going to be changed, especially after the sportsman race. You've been around stock car racing all your life. Your grandfather was a champion. Your dad has been seven time Grand National champion. Now you're competing. Did you ever dream that someday someone could come here to Charlotte, North Carolina and win $200,000 for less than an hour's racing? Not really. You know, uh, we're used to running three and four hour races for 50 and 60 thousand dollars, and now they're going to run for 200 thousand for just 70 laps. And uh, you know, th there's a lot of pressure on these guys to go out and do good. And you know, they've earned the position to be here by winning the races last year. It shows they were the 12 best drivers last year, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll be one of the ones next year. Well, a man who's been an integral part of the local sports scene here in Charlotte, North Carolina, has been covering Charlotte Motor Speedway for most of its 26 years. Let's join Bob Heiss. Thank you, Mike. You know, I have been here all week, and in fact, the last couple of months, as all of these teams are making tremendous preparations for this race this afternoon. You know, back in December, when Winston announced the fact that they would have this half-million-dollar race, all the teams that were eligible then began to make big plans. Some teams decided to build new cars. Some teams decided, well, maybe we ought to go with a car that we know is tested in truth. So that's what you're going to see among the field today. There has been a lot of preparation. They've been working weeks, months on these cars. They have been taking private practice sessions and renting the speedway here to get in some time between the other races on the regular NASCAR schedule. So they are ready. They are trying to set up. This is a handling track, as many of you have been telling. 
and they have been gone over with a fine tooth comb by the inspectors of NASCAR. They are set and ready to go. Down on pit road, they're getting set and ready to go. They're rolling the cars out from the garage area for the inaugural running of the Winston. We'll be back. There are over 100,000 sun-drenched race fans here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. They've just seen a great late model sportsman contest, and they're about to see a unique event in stock car racing history. This track was built in 1960, and they have continually improved it, expanded it, taken what was one grandstand and turned it into a grandstand that sweeps halfway around this speedway with condominiums, VIP suites. And we were talking earlier in the day, when you first started coming here, a lot of this place was just a hole in the ground. Yeah, most of uh, between turn three and four was just a big gully. And uh, I can remember coming here at seven, eight, nine years old. And, you know, it's tough for a seven or eight-year-old kid to watch a race, and especially the length of the World 600. And uh, we would bring bicycles and footballs and ride bicycles in a hole in the middle of the infield. And, uh, you know, as many times as daddy's won races and stuff, we'd ride a while and then go to Victory Lane and party a while. <laughs> it's that type of deal. So, uh, you know, we really enjoyed coming to Charlotte. Did you figure at age six that you'd be out here racing someday? Not really. I didn't even. I don't even think I dreamed about racing until I was on up a little bit older, and uh, you know, really knew what a car was and was able to drive around at the house and stuff. But uh, you know, after after the bug bit me, then you know, I can't think of any place I'd rather win than at Charlotte, North Carolina. To get into the Winston, the rule is: if you win, you're in. Let's take a look at the starting lineup and how the 12 drivers made it in the field. Here's the field for the richest race per mile in auto racing history. Terry Labonte is the defending Winston Cup champion, so he earns the pole position for the Winston. In the Billy Hagen-owned, Dale Inman prepared Piedmont Airlines Chevrolet, Labonte won at Riverside, California, and Bristol, Tennessee last season. This year, he has yet to visit Victory Lane. This is Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip earns the outside pole by virtue of his seven victories in 1984. Five times on the short track and twice on the super speedway in the Budweiser Chevrolet of Junior Johnson, prepared by Jeff Hammond. Harry Gant, the Skull Bandit Chevrolet. Travis Carter's the chief wrench. Hal Needham and Burt Reynolds, the car owners. In the second half of last season, Gant won at Pocono, Pennsylvania, Darlington, South Carolina, and Dover, Delaware. This year already has a full position and a victory. Bill Elliott, in the second half of last season, won at Michigan, Charlotte, and Rockingham. This year, he's been on the pole four times, and five times he's been in victory lane, all on super speedways in the Coors Thunderbird, owned by Harry Melling. Jeff Bodine came off the tough Northeastern NASCAR modified circuit to drive for Charlotte car dealer Rick Hendrick. Crew chief Harry Hyde in the Levi Garrett Chevrolet. Last year, he won at Martinsville, Virginia, Nashville, Tennessee, and Riverside, California. Cale Yarborough. From Timmonsville, South Carolina, now living in Sardis, Harry Rainier and J.T. Lundy own the Hardy's Thunderbird. Waddell Wilson's the crew chief and engine builder. Yarborough started last year with a bang, winning at Daytona, Talladega, and Pocono in June. Dale Earnhardt in the Wrangler Chevrolet, owned by former driver Richard Childress, and chief by Kirk Shelmerdine. Last year, Earnhardt, a victor at Talladega, Alabama, and Atlanta, Georgia. He's the 1980 Winston Cup stock car champion. Bobby Allison. In 25 years of racing, he's the sport's third leading all-time winner in the Miller American Buick, owned by Die Guard Racing, the team headed up by Gary Nelson. He won last year at Rockingham and last May here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Richard Petty, the king of stock car racing and the all-time winner, last year won at Dover, Delaware. And last July at Daytona with President Reagan looking on, he won at Daytona. The STP Pontiac is owned by Mike Kerr. Mike Beam is the crew chief. Ricky Rudd of Chesapeake, Virginia, in the Budmore Motorcraft Ford Thunderbird, won on the short track last February at Richmond, Virginia. He's a three-time career winner in Winston Cup stock car racing. In the final row, inside the only single driver in the field, flamboyant Tim Richmond. The Ashland, Ohio native lives on Lake Norman in North Carolina. Drives for former drag racing champion Raymond Beadle and crew chief Barry Dotson in the old Milwaukee Pontiac. He won at North Wilkesboro last April. And Benny Parsons, the nice guy of stock car racing, drives the Copenhagen Chevrolet for Leo and Richard Jackson and crew chief Cliff Champion. Last March, Benny won on the mile and a half super speedway in Atlanta, Georgia. He has 21 career victories. Here's what's at stake this afternoon in the Winston. First prize, 
$200,000 for 105 miles of racing, the richest race per mile in auto racing history. Second is worth $75,000. Third is worth 50. Fourth is 40,000. Then 30 and 15 for the sixth spot. And on back through the field from seventh place on back, 13, 12, 5, and down to $10,000 just to start. There are some events on the 28 race grand national schedule where that $10,000 figure, well, you could just about earn that for second place. We've talked with Kyle Petty about the Ford race car, the Thunderbird, how superior it is on the mile and a half track like Charlotte, and how Bill Elliott has had such tremendous success with it all season long. Neil Bonnet will be along with us to prevent the Chevrolet point of view, but for a rather objective, we hope. Look at the Ford versus Chevrolet controversy here. Let's go to the garage area. Hello, everyone. This is Benny Parsons. I'm going to try to give you my opinion on the controversy is which is better, the Ford or Chevrolet, as far as the aerodynamics is concerned. The problem, we look at the Chevrolet. This is the Monte Carlo. The nose is very, very good on this car. You can see that it's very round, but it is kind of flat and very wide. Now we look over at this Ford, and we see that the nose is not as flat. It is more round than a Chevrolet, plus it is more narrow than a Chevrolet. So therefore, it ought to go through the wind just a little bit better. We go back on the Ford. The windshield lays back very well, probably about like the Chevrolet. But I really feel like that one of the biggest differences in the Ford versus the Monte Carlo is the rear window on this Ford. As you can see, it is on a very good slant. The air comes across the hood, down this rear window, and against the rear air dam. Therefore, applying some pressure on the rear tires of this car and helping it get through the turns immensely. Now we look at the Chevrolet, and we look at the back window on this Chevrolet, and you can see how quickly that it drops off. So therefore, what happens is the air goes across this roof. It, it, it can't follow the windshield because, look, it's traveling 150 miles an hour. It goes across, and it comes down, and it completely misses the rear air dam. You can see the angle of the rear air dam on this car, the Copenhagen Chevrolet, versus the hardest Ford we looked at just a moment ago. There's probably 30 or 40 degrees difference in how the rear air dam stands up. The only air that we can get on the Chevrolets to add for rear down pressure is off the side, and they come back and they hit the rear spoiler, the rear air dam, somewhere right on the edge, about five or six inches in. And really and truly, I believe that this is the biggest difference in the Ford and Chevrolet, the rear window. Now, Kyle, we hope that's an objective look at this, but we have to remember Benny Parsons drives the Chevrolet. Do you think that's a pretty fair picture of the difference? That's pretty close. Uh, you know, the back window does have a lot to do with it. On some of the racetracks, you know, on the racetracks that we've been ro running, uh, you know, I can't say that, it, that it's that got that big a problem with it. Uh, you know, Bill right now is just, his car's really handling good. You know, he's got a lot of combinations. It's just like Dan said when they interviewed him earlier. They have took a lot of small ingredients, packed them in one big pie, and made a nice pie out of it. You know, and everything seems to be working nice. So, uh, you know, that, that was pretty good, though. Well, some people have seemed to have lost sight of that. It's not the Ford race car is so tremendous. It's one car in particular that's just dominating this sport. Well, that's true. You know, we went to Talladega, and I guess Bill ran a little over 209, which was just totally awesome down there. And, uh, you know, everybody else was from like 203, 204 back. And, you know, it really worked good. The, the rule change, the half-inch rule change seemed to tighten up the spread of the field. One of the safest races they've ever had at Talladega. And things were beginning to look good. And, uh, you know, uh, don't get me wrong, I guess the Fords finished four out of the top five down there, so it didn't look too good on paper. But, you know, uh, the, the Chevys had just as good a chance to run with them. And uh, Dale Earnhardt and his Chevy ran all day. Richard Petty in a Pontiac who would have expected that at, at Talladega ran strong all day until his car broke but uh, you know the Fords seem to have hit on something and it's working right now well there's Chevys Pontiacs Buicks and uh, excuse me Oldsmobiles that are out here this Definitely. afternoon for the Winston we'll be right back with more of the Winston right after these words from your local station at Charlotte Motor Speedway, the 12 drivers that will compete in the Winston are being paraded around the speedway for the 100,000 plus fans to see in the back seats of convertible cars. You see on your screen and the crowd is really becoming interested in the proceeding here. Pre-race ceremonies will be beginning momentarily. What a throng of people that are here on a Saturday afternoon. I don't think we've ever seen a Saturday crowd at any racetrack to rival this one. No, definitely not. You know, uh, 
there's been crowds before and I think Humphrey's had 80 and 90,000 but nothing like the crowd he's got here today you know it's just you can't believe the people I can remember a lot of the places coming here especially back in the early 70s and stuff and he'd have maybe half this many people before a Saturday show and then to know that they're gonna be here tomorrow is just great for about 10 years there was a drought of new talent in stock car racing and that's evidenced by the fact that of these 12 drivers five are in their 40s and five are in their 20s. There's only two drivers, Bodine and Waltrip, in their 30s. And everyone said, where will the new stars come from? I think that's been answered. Definitely so. Uh, you know, when you look back on it, when my father started and stuff, when Daddy and Baker and all them come along, there was a 20-year gap between themselves and, and Lee Petty and Buck Baker and Joe Weatherly and the Fireball Roberts, the guys that came along then. And, you know, it, it was a little while before they really got the, any new talent in. Well, some of that talent is now standing on pit road. Let's go to Johnny Hayes. I'm with Daryl Waltrip. Daryl, this is a big one. Last year you won seven races. This year you hadn't won. You've run good. You've had some good things happen to you. I think today might turn the whole season around for you. Well, the guy that wins this race today is obviously going to make a lot of money. And uh, this is one of the most important races we'll run this year. So this would be a big turning point for me and my uh, crew and everybody if we could win this race today. But I tell you, after they just got finished racing on this racetrack, none of us have been out there. It's kind of like jumping in the pool for the first time. You don't know how cold the water is. Uh, have you got a special game plan for this race? It's, I know it's flat out 100 miles or so. What are you going to do? I want to try to get in front and stay there. I know that sounds like a, a very simple philosophy, but if I can get in front right off, stretch out a little bit and get a comfortable lead, that would really be to my advantage. Who do you figure your number one competition out there is today? My number one competition is number nine. <laughs> I sure appreciate it. Have good luck. Back to you, Mike. At the Charlotte Motor Speedway, pre-race activity continues. We'll return to the Winston right after this word. Drivers are now coming to the pre-race stage to be introduced to the crowd and then they'll strap into those race cars and take on a racetrack that they've not seen since yesterday afternoon. But one fellow who's just been out there for 300 fast miles is Neil Bonnet. What kind of shape is the track in? Mike, it's a little bit cool today, but still that sun's been bearing down on the track and the thing's exceptionally slick up in the third and fourth turn and I look for the guys to have to deal with it. A good handling race car is going to show up today. We noticed a lot of cautions in the sportsman race off turn number four. How did you have to adjust your driving style to deal with that part of the racetrack? We had to make chassis adjustments during the race to tighten the car up in that particular corner. And the only thing we're looking at in this race, they've got one chance to do that. They're going to have to make the right decision. How tough is it to guess on the right chassis setup to start this race? Well, I'm sure these guys are calculating what they need. They've got some of the best people in the world doing it for them. But still, you're going to see some changes when this race starts. Will Darrell Waltrip have an advantage due to the fact that you were on the radio talking to him? He owns the car you drove in this sportsman race. And he's got a pretty good second-hand opinion on what the track's like. Well, I told him what it felt like up there in the third, fourth turn. We made some changes. It helped my particular car in that race. If they can use that on this car, it might be of some benefit. You drive a Chevrolet on the Grand National Circuit. You've already qualified for the 1986 Winston by winning at Rockingham, North Carolina in March. Is there a place on this racetrack where the Chevrolet has an advantage over the Ford Thunderbird? Mike, the Chevrolet seem to have a lot of response right off the corner, off turn two and off turn three and four up here. What I'm looking at now is since we've got this condition off turn four, that power burst that they have might go against them. I don't know. We're just going to have to see what happens. That Ford's going to be awful tough the way they handle. Well, if the Chevrolet jumps well off the corner, Kyle Petty, you get in your Ford, and where do you catch them and run them down? Exactly. You, you catch them. I think you catch them off turn four, off turn two and turn four. It's the type of deal where, uh, you know, like he says, the track's slick. You, if you've got all the power in the world and can't use it, it does you no good. When that Ford gets down and gets in that crawling gear and comes up off that corner when it's slick, then you'll see the Fords drive away, I hope. The Chevrolet handling setup seems to change a lot. When the car is either full of gas as opposed to getting toward empty or when the track is slick or when it's in good shape. How about the Chevrolet? Does it stay pretty consistent all day or does it change a lot? Mike, that's what we've been battling with the Chevrolet. The rear weight is not as good. The distribution on the rear wheels. What we're doing is putting a lot of bite in the car, which means you're putting a lot of bite in the chassis. The Chevrolets are sitting there with a lot of real low gear ratio, more than normal for a race of this length. And it's going to be interesting to see who can go the distance and still be in one piece. How many of the car owners and crew chiefs have put hand grenades underneath the hoods of these cars to try and catch Bill Elliott? Mike, for $200,000, they're all done with a hand grenade and they're fixing to pull the pin. 
The man they've all been chasing all week long, not only Neil Bonnet and Kyle Petty, but every driver in the garage area has been Bill Elliott from Georgia. He's won five races this season. Let's meet him. Dawsonville, Georgia. Tucked away in the North Georgia mountains, it's a community with a lifestyle that's unassuming and down to earth. This is the hometown of one of NASCAR's most successful family racing teams, the Coors Melling Thunderbird, fielded by the Elliots. Already this year, the Coors Melling Thunderbird has won five races and four poles. Today, Bill Elliott can earn $200,000 with a win in the Winston. Tomorrow, Bill Elliott can collect a $1 million bonus if he can win the Coca-Cola World 600. Yes, we're trying to work hard. You know, you have got a chance at winning a million dollars, and that's something that's never been heard of in this sport. But just four years ago at the fall race in Atlanta, the Elliots, without a sponsor and few resources, were ready to fold their tent, go back to Dawsonville, Georgia, and leave racing. And that was to be our last race. We had no money to build a new car with, and, and no money, definitely no money to operate the next year with. You know, we had decided that year that we had gone as far as we could go. You know, it's a, uh, it's a situation, this business, you've got, you've got to be very well off financially. Harry Melling came along just at the right time, and, and uh, the rest of it then is history. With the Harry Melling Tool Company purchase of the race team, things began to happen. In 1982, the Elliots finished 15 of 21 races and won a quarter million dollars. In 1983, Bill Elliott won a half a million dollars and his first race, the Riverside 500 in California. Dawsonville, Georgia rolled out the red carpet for its favorite son. It seemed like everybody I'd ever known was there. Uh, a lot of the people, well, about all, I think all the people from around this county came, and there was some from the neighboring counties that I knew. It seemed like every, every time I turned around, there was somebody there I knew. Coors Brewing Company became a full sponsor in 1984 adding an influx of money and security that a race team needs most to be competitive. In 84, the Coors Melling Thunderbird won three races, four pole positions, and almost $700,000. Each NASCAR race team works for an advantage over their competition. The Elliots and their competition concede that much of the Elliots' advantage this year is the cumulative effect of the past years of hard work and dedication as a family. They worked day and night, including, including Christmas Day, to get ready for the, for the Daytona race. Working hard, winning, and being the most successful race team this year has brought the Elliots a lot of fame and notoriety. How have they handled it? Fame doesn't mean a whole lot to me, and I, I don't think it does to Bill either. Uh, you know, most of all this stuff is you can, you know, you can be the highlight one day, and, you can barely be remembered the next. I don't really worry about it that much. You know, there's times that I get a little bit aggravated with it because, you know, I am so much a part of the car and it takes me away from that. And that's, I guess that's my pride and joy. And You've come a long way, son. I knew you before you hit the big time. Uh, now we're out here racing for big dollars. Uh, how does it look? Well, I'll tell you, Johnny, you know, it's something. Uh, we're going to go out and do the best we can do and whatever happens is going to happen. You know, and I just hope it's, pray it's a good, safe race and everything comes out all right no matter who wins. Were you having fun now that you got all this money, or is the pressure getting to you? Well, the thing of it is, it ain't the money standpoint of it. But, you know, I like to stay competitive and run good, and I think just the sport of auto racing is what I love. You know, when there's days you don't have a good time, which I'm sure in your job you're the same way, but we go out and do the best we can do, and I we'll hope we have a good time. Well, we all pulling for you. Have a good one. Thank you, Johnny. See you. See you later. Back up to you, Mike. He doesn't look nervous, Neil, but it has been a little tense down there all week. I'm telling you what, the money, the amount of money that's on the line, the prestige that's involved and everything, you know, Bill's handling it real well, and uh, he's got a pretty good pressure relief valve in that forward sitting there. It's hard to ignore the money, but, but face it, each of these 12 fellows, you and Kyle, are competitors. I've seen you go out and run just as hard for $600 to win as I have seen you run for 60000 Mike, I was up in Huntsville, Alabama about three weeks ago racing for 800 to win, and I ran just as hard that day as if I was buckling up out there for 200 But these guys are fixing to turn some mighty good race cars loose for the best money we've ever had. Well, not everybody's a Bill Elliott fan, as we can see. We've said that this race may be won or lost on pit road, and Larry Newber is standing with the winningest crew chief in the history of NASCAR racing. 
Well, Dale Inman was the man who was in charge through all those Richard Petty glory years. His car starts on the pole today because Terry Labonte was the champion last year. Shouting instructions to all of his crew members. Dale, what do you think? You guys going to charge right from the beginning or kind of hold back? Well, I think you're going to have to go, but, you know, starting on the pole don't necessarily mean that you're going to lead the first lap because, uh, like Atlanta and, and places like this, the third and uh, fourth place, people have a good shot of going to the front. So. I don't think nobody can really uh, set a strategy because you're running against the best and you're just going to have to go go every lap just as good as you can. Is this the kind of race where you're racing against yourself in the clock or are you going to be keying off the other competitors? No, you got to race. You got to be there first. That's what you need to do. You just need to beat them all. You can't beat just one person. You got to beat them all. Well, if anybody knows how to get it done, how to beat them all, it's this guy. Kyle. That's your dad's cousin, and I think it's fair to say that he is probably the master strategist of maybe anybody on pit road at figuring out how to win a race after the green flag drops. Definitely so. Uh, you know, I, I can think of three or four incidents when it came down to the last pit stop at Daytona and we either change tires or wouldn't change tires or act like we were going to change tires and psych somebody out. And, uh, you know, he knows when to pit, when not to pit, and what to do on the pit stops. Well, there's one crew chief that perhaps among all those on pit road is responsible, if not for more innovations, but for having the guts to try different things, things that other people think might be a little odd. But it's one of a lot of races. His name is Harry Hyde, and he's with Bob Heiss. Yes, Harry Hyde, uh, you've been working for six months. You built a brand new car for this race, and then yesterday something went wrong inspection. What's that? Well, we had a quarter pad a little bit too long, and uh, rather than uh, start cutting on it over here, we just took it back and got another car. It was a lot easier that way. It's kind of frustrating to work that long and set that particular car up and then not be able to use it. Well, it really uh, wasn't a mistake, and it wasn't anything that we got caught with. What happened is the rules got so strict, uh, normally they would have let that car win because, but here we had to weigh exactly the same amount. Uh, we had to drain our gas tanks, fill them at the union pump. We had to do everything exactly by the book, and they didn't want to deviate from that. And uh, I really didn't uh, mind uh, getting tight on the rules. It makes it better for everybody. So which car did you go to? Well, we went back and got the old over car that we ran last week and worked till about 2 o'clock in the morning on it, rushed it over here, and then it runs real good, and uh, we're expecting to win this race today. Okay, and that's the story from Harry Hyde. Well, Neil, that's fair. If you have a baseball all-star game, you don't play it with different bats and gloves than you use during the season. That's right, and uh, I was just so glad to see Harry Hyde Center tell me he'd like to see a run by the rule book. I've driven for Harry. He's quite a character, and I'm sure that car is ready to go. <laughs> I'll bet it is. Bodine ran well in practice here, both practice for the World 600 and for the Winston. Larry Newber is standing by with a man who will start shotgun on the field. Tail end Charlie, Benny Parsons. Well, Benny Parsons may start last in this race, but it's only a 12-car field. I don't think you're at a real disadvantage. I don't think so. Uh, you know, on a restart tomorrow on a caution flag, we're going to be back here a few times. So this is simply like a restart on a caution flag during a 500-mile race. The problem is the inside lane is very fast. Well, Benny, I would imagine, though, sitting back here, this kind of gives you a nice view of the race. You can really psych out what everybody else is doing, who the fast ones are. You're right, Larry. you got to go racing. Well, Benny's got to go racing. He's got to start his engine. The president of the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, Gerald H. Long, the man who, along with the special events department, Ralph Seagraves, Wayne Robertson, and the boys in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, dreamt up the Winston, has just issued the command of 12 drivers to fire engines, and a fireworks display worthy of 4th of July goes off in the back straightaway as thousands of balloons are released into the atmosphere and 12 engines stir to life on pit road. That's quite a moment in sports. I don't think there's anything like it when those engines fire up. Mike, I've, I've been there so many times and uh, sitting there just waiting, enthusiastic. And when that thing, you get concerned about your job, but then it's ready to go. You're looking at the starting lineup for the Winston. Labonte in a Chevrolet. So is Waltrip. Gant Chevrolet, Elliott's Ford in row two. Jeff Bodine, Chevrolet, Cale Yarborough's Thunderbird in row number three. Dale Earnhardt, he's in a Chevrolet. Bobby Allison has the one Buick in the field. In row number five, Richard Petty's Pontiac, Ricky Rudd's Ford. And in row number six, Tim Richmond's Pontiac and the Chevrolet of Benny Parsons. They're aligned behind the Ford Thunderbird pace car, warming those engines, bringing things up to temperature. Kyle, how long does that take to get these motors up to temperature, and then you have to go around and get the transmission rear end grease up to temperature before you can go racing? Well, on a day like today, it shouldn't take that long. Uh, you know, they'll probably let them warm up three or four minutes and then go ahead and run two or three pace laps, and that'll get the motor warmer. It'll get everything ready, and, uh, you know, I don't think the drivers could be any more warmer or any ready than they already are. Neil, lets the engines warm up just to give the driver a chance maybe to cool down, shake off the butterflies, and just get rid of all that apprehension and concentrate on what's in front of you. 
Mike, you know, they're, they're sitting there, they got one specific job in mind. They know basically how their car is running. They've sat there and clocked the other guys. They're looking around each other, seeing who's where. They're ready to go. It's just the kind of deal where they're fixing to put their game plan into effect. $60,000 race cars with $20,000 engines. Racing for half a million dollars here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. You couldn't get another camper in that infield. They're the first turn condominiums. Bobby Allison owns one. Several of the drivers do. And a packed grandstand. The pace car rolls, and with it, 12 race cars. Eight are away. Now Ricky Rudd, Richard Petty, Tim Richmond, Benny Parsons. The field heads off for turn one on the first of the pace laps. Inspectors return to pit road, and the pit crews, their job is, well, it's not quite done. There's the mandatory pit stop between laps 30 and 39, where they'll have to come to pit road, where this race could be won or lost. Field heads off into turn number one, and we'll be back with live coverage of the Winston right after these messages. There will be a goodies headache award this afternoon. The driver that has the biggest headache in the running of this event, our Jefferson Pilot Teleproductions team will vote, and that driver will receive $500. That's nothing compared to the $200,000 that the winner will receive in the Winston. The light is out atop the safety car as it leads the field off into turn number one. Neil Bonnet, if you're in Darrell Walters' car, lined up on the outside of the front row, what are you thinking right now? You're fixing to see one heck of a drag race. These guys are really going to turn these cars coming down through here. The lead is going to be a big factor, I feel, in this race. The track is exceptionally slick, and the guy out front, there's the ball standing there. The guy out front's going to be hard to get around. That's Junior Johnson, who owns the cars run on the Grand National Circuit by Darrell Walters and Neil Bonnet. Joey Knuckles, who's with the Hardy's team for Cale Yarborough, on headset with his driver. Waddell Wilson's the crew chief there. This is one of the few times you're going to see tension in the pits. These guys are going to be a big factor with this pit, pit stop coming up in this race. Kyle Petty, if you're Bill Elliott, you're third on the field. What do you want to do on the start? You know, with the, with the strengths he's shown all year, I feel like that he'll just try to get in line, get a steady pace, and uh, try and work his way back up through there. Jerry Long is on the flag stand. He'll drop the green flag. Then NASCAR starter Harold Kinder will take over for the rest of these 70 laps. 100,000-plus race fans are on their feet. The pace car is on pit road. The richest race per mile in auto racing history is about to get the green flag, and green is on. Terry Labonte is quickest up through the gearbox. He's the blue and white Chevrolet right side of your screen. But Waltrip is there in turn number one, and by half a car length, Waltrip picks up an early lead. Labonte, bottom of the racetrack, comes storming back off turn number two, and it's Chevrolet side by side. Gant is third, Elliott is fourth, Bodine has the pit spot, Earnhardt is sixth. Turn three, and it's still a drag race, and still a dead heat. One mile around this Charlotte Motor Speedway, half a mile to go to complete lap one. Nobody's cracking the throttle. Mike, I believe this is an indication of what we're going to see all day. Nobody's going to give an inch. We're already swapping the colors in race cars. Three wide at the start-finish line. Harry Gant goes to the bottom of the racetrack, and there's no room. He has to tuck back in behind the two leaders. It is now Waltrip opening up a one-car advantage, a scant advantage on the outside. Labonte is the meat in the sandwich, and Harry Gant is third. Where are the Fords? I don't really know. You know, Bill's had trouble yesterday. He never got a chance to really practice that car because he was having trouble with his 600 car. And, uh, you know, he's just kind of laying back right now, feeling where it's at. There's Yarborough and Elliott. They are running sixth and seventh on the field behind Bodine and Earnhardt directly ahead. And up front, Waltrip, Labonte, and Harry Gant. Darrell Walter perhaps called it in the pre-race. He'd go out there and just put his foot down and try to run away. Mike, that was pretty impressive on the outside of this racetrack. As slick as it is to be able to run side by side and pull out the lead, it's pretty strong right now. Here's first, second, third. Waltrip on the left, Labonte in the middle, and on the right, Harry Gant, the third place car. They have about eight car lengths back to fourth place, Jeff Bodine. And Bodine leads a fast field of characters. There's Bodine on the left, Dale Earnhardt, Bill Elliott way up high on the racetrack, and Cale Yarborough looking underneath him. Start finish line, lap number three. Waltrip by just a car length. Here's Yarborough working underneath Bill Elliott down at turn number one. And Elliott just cuts him off at the pass, but Bill can't keep that car on the bottom of the racetrack. It's not looking like it's handling it. Uh, like I say, he, he didn't get a chance to practice it yesterday afternoon. The car might be a little loose. That's where that one pit stop's going to really help these guys. Junior Johnson said yesterday we've got one chance to beat Bill Elliott. If he guesses wrong on his setup, then we can get out front and try to get away from him. Here's Walter off the fourth corner, back to the start-finish line as Budweiser Chevrolet paces the field. Labonte, the Winston Cup champion, on second. Harry Gant, third. Fourth is Jeff Bodine, and they've broken away a bit. A lot of good racing in the back of the pack. Betty Parsons started in 12th. You just saw him side-by-side -side with Tim Richmond there momentarily. Walter running a pretty high line around this racetrack, Neil. 
I talked to Darrell before the race. He said his car was a little bit tight. If he's able to stay out front with a tight race car, the track is a little slick. He should be in good shape. He's he using up a lot of the racetrack, but he's running awful good. Walter Milavani single file. Harry Hant, Jeff Bodine. There's the front four. Coming off the fourth corner into the little dog leg and back to the start finish line. Bodine, the fourth place car, has nine tenths of a second. On the fifth place machine, that is Dale Earnhardt. And in the back of the pack, a lot of jostling again among the boards. This time it's Jarborough, Ricky Rudd, and Bill Elliott mixing it up in turn number two. And Kale took a spot from Elliott that time. Rudd trying to follow suit on the inside. He's the white and red Ford number 15. That's Ricky Rudd of Chesapeake, Virginia. Here comes Jarborough. He's got the horsepower to get down into turn number three. But on the left corner of your screen, Dale Earnhardt, car number three, holds Jarborough at bay as they come back to start finish. Lap number seven. Earnhardt and Yarborough. Dale, one tough customer. His sponsor slogan, and he lives up to that. Yarborough, when there's money on the line, he's a tough man to beat. Up front, Walter, Labonte, Camp, and Bodine. Mike, I'm sorry. One thing I noticed is during the sportsman race just a few minutes ago, the groove moved up high in one and two. There was up there working awful good on that part of the racetrack. And you can run up there to keep the tires a little bit cooler. Waltrip won seven times last season, five times on the short track, twice on the super speedways. Bob Heiss is on pit road with the crew chief for Darrell Waltrip. Bob? Yes, Jeff Hammond is here. He's trying to check on timings and everything else. How's Darrell running? He went to the quick, uh, to the front very quickly. So far, the car is really performing well. Uh, you know, he's still got a long ways to go, but uh, right now, you know, we're very much pleased. Was that the strategy to try to go up front as quick as you could? Well, you, we just wanted to make sure we stayed up close to the front. If we couldn't lead, we wanted to make sure we could keep the leaders, you know, really close by because, like, being a 100-mile race, you couldn't stand to be very far behind. We do have to stop. We're going to be in a good position where we maybe can uh, capitalize on somebody's mistake or a good stop and try to get a little bit more of a leader game. So we're working okay. out the best way we can. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Jeff Hammer, the crew chief for Darrell Waltrip. Yeah, I noticed down the back straightaway, I could get a good look at Daryl's car, and there's a wheel mark on the side, and that was the first lap of this race. What's the last lap going to look like? When they bunch him up on his pit stop, it's going to be interesting here in a little while. Here's the front four, but they're shuffling from fifth on back. Cale Yarbrough is the man on the move. He's driven underneath Dale Earnhardt's Wrangler Chevrolet, and the Hardy Thunderbird is now in fifth spot. Cale's car really looks like it's working now through one and two. He's able to jump up under him coming off two over there. Another car that's moving up is Bobby Allison. He's come from way back in the back where he got called at the beginning of the race. And it's been able to move back up into fourth and fifth position. There's been a split in the four-car draft at the head of the pack. Jeff Bodine has gotten underneath here again. And as on the start of the race, did Waltrip and Labonte. These two cars are locked in a dead heat now for the third spot. You're watching fifth on back. There's sixth place Earnhardt. Allison in seventh. The Buick beginning to ramble and pull up underneath Dale Earnhardt in turn number three. Ricky Rudd is there. Car number 15. That's a four. And right behind them, Benny Parsons Chevrolet that started 12th and has moved up to the ninth position. Dale Earnhardt. Allison tracking him for a place to get by. It isn't any easy place to get by on this racetrack. There's certainly not Mike, and let me tell you, Dale Earnhardt is one of the hardest guys to pass on this racetrack. He'll drive that thing so far off in the corner. You'll see somebody get under him, and he'll just drive way down in the corner. It's almost impossible. Here's Bobby up there. It looks like they're going to make it by this time, but Dale's awful tough on this racetrack. Here he comes back on the outside. He never gives up. And Ricky runs four, just could not get into the corner well enough to get under Earnhardt. Now Earnhardt leaves just a little bit of opening, and Rudd is there. They're off turn four, headed for the start-finish line and racing for sixth position. Earnhardt has the nose of his Chevrolet tucked right up under the bumper of Allison. And there are five cars under a blanket down in turns one and two, and this is only for sixth position. Allison breaks away. Here comes Parsons. He's going to make it three wide on the inside, and they make a sandwich out of Ricky Rudd in the back stretch. The only problem, they got a little curve they got to make down here at the end. Mike, they're going to get straight back out, and they made it. Average speed, 10 laps, 161 miles an hour. That's faster than half the field qualified for Sunday's World 600. I'll tell you what, we're sitting there talking about these other guys, and Richmond's really entered into the picture now. He's right in there behind Benny, and he's coming from way back in the pack. He seems to be running very well. Tim Richmond started 11th. He has climbed up the bump place car right now. He is that of Richard Petty, shotgun on the field. 11th is Bill Elliott, the man everyone thought they'd have to beat today. 10th is Ricky Rudd. Ninth is Benny Parsons, eighth is Tim Richmond, seventh is Dale Earnhardt. In sixth is Bobby Allison, and here comes Ricky Rudd again, and they make the sandwich out of Tim Richmond, and back he goes. And Kyle, it's hard to keep your foot in the throttle when you got somebody on either side like that. When you get in the middle like that, there's not much you can do except get out of it and let those guys have the groove and try and get back around them a little bit later. It's unreal to see this type of racing 
on this track right now, this early in the race. Uh, you know, I know they're going for 200,000, but th there's some stuff going on out there that doesn't usually go on. The field is single file. Daryl Waltrip is the leader. As we take a look, Bodine is in trouble in the back straightaway. Car number five, Jeff Bodine. The Levi Garrett Chevrolet, the all-star racing entry, slows as the battle is rejoined back in the pack up in turn number three. Here are the lead cars coming back to the start-finish line to complete lap 15, Waltrip and Labonte. And here's Bodine on pit road. The Shimon New York Speedster has started racing at age five in go-karts on a quarter-mile track owned by his father up in Shimon County. He's come off the tough NASCAR modified circuit where one year he won 65 of the 80 races he entered. And he comes to a halt, Harry High. And Tommy Johnson and crew will lift the hood. But Bodine, if he loses a lap in a race as competitive as this, his day will be over. It's a tough break for Jeff. He was running awful strong in practice yesterday afternoon and uh, really was one of the fastest cars here all week long. And, you know, to have something like this happen this early in the race is tough. It's terminal on Bodine's car. They'll push it back to the garage area. As the battle for the lead heats up down in turn number two. Waltrip, car number 11, and Lavani in 44. Waltrip's car owned by Junior Johnson, Lavani's by Billy Hagan. Here, further back in the pack, Ricky Rudd has been in the thick of it all day, and he's battling Tim Richmond. Richmond in 27, the Pontiac runs 15 a Ford. Here comes Benny Parson, up who wants to be part of the proceedings. They're running for seventh position. These cars are all running about the same speed, and, uh, you know, a guy will get in the lead and lead a lap, and the guy running behind him thinks he's got enough to get around him and go on, and they're just dicing it up and getting further and further behind. But, uh, you know, with a pit stop in a race like this, they'll have their opportunity to make some changes and maybe come back a little bit later on. Richmond there is seventh, Ricky Rudd is eighth, Benny Parsons ninth, and Bill Elliott, a disappointing and surprising tenth. Richard Petty is 11th, and Jeff Bodine's car has gone to the garage area. Waltrip's the leader, Labonte is second. They've opened up quite a separation on the field. 17 laps complete. Coming up on lap number 20, and the leader of that lap gets $10,000. And you see Labonte drawing a bead, getting very close to Waltrip there, and we'll see if he chooses to make his move and go for the 10 grand. Like this particular car here was built up at Junior Shops just across the creek from mine, and the Chevrolet engineers have been working hand in hand to see if they can, could combat the effort Ford's put out, and Darrell's car seems to be working exceptionally well, and so does Terry's right now. Walter coming off the fourth turn, back to the start-finish stripe. Labonte glued tightly right in his draft. They are 2.8 seconds ahead of the third-place car, Harry Gant. Yarborough's fourth, Allison's fifth, Earnhardt is sixth, seventh. Is Tim Richmond, eighth is Ricky Rudd, ninth Betty Parsons, tenth Bill Elliott, and eleventh Richard Petty. You're watching Earnhardt. He's the sixth place car. Way up the racetrack goes Ricky Rudd. Way high at turns one and two, looking for perhaps a better groove around the racetrack. Back up front, coming up to the bonus money lap, ten thousand dollars to the leader of lap number twenty. Waltrip, Labonte. They're in two-way radio contact with their crews, counting the laps, winding it down. 19 laps complete. Next time by $10,000. Here's Labonte making his move to the inside. The $10,000 will put you to work, and Terry's going to try it down on the bottom a while. Waltrip up high. Labonte on the bottom of the racetrack, and everybody on their feet. It is Waltrip. It is Labonte. Labonte will drag race Waltrip to turn number three. Now we'll see who's got the handle. For $10,000, they might change a little bit of colors on those race cars. Here they come from coming off four. It's going to be awful tight. Waltrip a little bit loose up in three. Here comes Labonte right down the bottom of the racetrack. It's the short way around. It's Labonte. Labonte wins $10,000 by the length of that $10,000 bill. I'll tell you what, it was quite a show for 10 grand, but if they keep racing like that, that backpack's going to catch up a little bit. Uh, Terry is showing me something, showing all of us something there. If he could pull up there and take that kind of lap, he might have a little bit left. That side-by-side -side racing allowed third place Harry Gant to close to within two seconds of the lead duo. Up in turns three and four, here's Walter and Labonte. Terry a little bit loose off the corner that time. Mike, what happens on a deal like that is he abused his car for a lap or two there to hold it down under Daryl and turn it and heated his tires up. He can follow him a lap or two now, get the tires cooled back down, he's ready to go one more time. Waltrip's the leader. We know Labonte can pass him. He got underneath him to win the $10,000. But Waltrip has his eye on the $200,000 at the end of the rainbow. We'll be right back with more of the Winston after this word from your local station. 
Darrell Waltrip leads the Winston, but by the slimmest of margins, half a car length. Terry Labonte is right alongside him. Gant, Yarborough, Allison, and Earnhardt. Here goes Labonte once again. And he snuck under Waltrip to get the lead. He may not have it all the way to the start-finish line, and you don't lead this race officially unless you lead it at the stripe. Here they come to complete lap 25. Labonte, give this to Labonte. It's the second lap he's led today. He led lap number 20 for $10,000. Let's take another look at it. Neil? I tell you what, you know, they, they were kind of flirting with each other there, seeing if they could get a little bit of extra room. Neither one of them gave any ground, and it was just a drag race to the line. And that little bit of distance you're going to see right here put 10,000 at a bank for Terry. More like flirting with disaster. <laughs> That's exactly at 160 right. miles an hour. Terry Labonte now leads the Winston. He goes in front on lap number 25. Darrell Waltrip stays right in his draft, and that may have allowed Harry Gant to close up. I tell you what, Mike, you know, Terry showed us the ability to come from behind and take that lead. I think he saw Harry Gant closing up on him and decided to pick the pace up himself. They moved out front, and now we're going to see if he can pull out a little distance on him. There's the front four. Left side of your screen is Labonte. Here is Bill Elliott, and Elliott is running a dismal 10th place. His crew chief and brother, Ernie Elliott, is standing by with Larry Newber. Well, Ernie just had to run back to the garage. They're doing a little bit of scrambling around back here. They're trying to figure out exactly why Bill is going so slow. Any guesses? Well, right, right now, the, we're having trouble with the transmission. It seems to be jumping out of high gear, and he's having to hold the car in gear and drive with one hand. So right now, we're a little behind. That's what those rubber straps were for, those bungee cords you hope to perhaps wrap around the transmission shaft, right? Yeah, but he'll have to do that after he gets the car in high gear and gets back out on the racetrack, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be hard to do. Well, it's going to be tough sled for Bill Elliott, but he still has potentially the fastest car in this field. That's Bill's other brother, Dan Elliott, who also works on the engines with Ernie back in Dawsonville, Georgia. Good battle back in the pack behind Terry Labonte, Darrell Waltrip, and the third-place driver, Harry Gant, in the Skull Bandit, Chevrolet has caught Walter. Has the handle gone away on Darrell's car, or is the rest of the field picking up the pace? Darrell's run awful high the whole race, and it looked like he was in an ideal place up there. But if all, all of a sudden, you know, Terry goes by him, and here's Harry Gant going down the back straightaway, making a move on him. So evidently, he's going away just a little bit. Harry Gant moving up for second place. We look a little further back in the pack. We find Earnhardt Parsons locked in a battle with Bobby Allison. Off turn number four come the leaders. Labonte and then side-by-side -side battle for the second spot. There's Earnhardt running with Benny Parsons and Bill Elliott. Well back in the field. And up front, Labonte gets to open it up a bit as Harry Gant has gone underneath Darrell Waltrip and Kale Yarborough closes in. Kyle, we've not seen much from Kale so far in this race, but he, is, he fell back a bit, picked his way up through the field pretty well. Well, he dropped back there at the beginning and the car's been working real well distance from where he's at right now to first place, he's really closed up on the leaders. Labonte's car's really been working good, but Kale's car's also been working well. And uh, if he gets up in there, there's nobody that dices it around any better than Kale Yarbrough. Kale's in fourth spot, and he's just barely two seconds behind the leader. Mike, and he also has a luxury now, just like a stepping stone. He can use Darrell to pull up. If he can get around Darrell, he's got, he's got Harry Gant, then it's just one more step to the lead. He can climb each rung of the ladder going to the lead right now. The flagman, Harold Kinder, is holding out a special flag used only in this event. It's a flag with the logo of the Winston, and it means that 30 laps have arrived. Sometime within the next 10 laps, each driver must make a pit stop and change two tires. I think one thing here that's really helping Kale. Here's Harry Gant. Gant will immediately hop onto pit road at lap 31. Travis Carter and the Skull Bandit crew are poised to serve as Gant. He must fill his gas tank and take on two tires. Mike, a lot of the thinking here is, 30 laps on a set of tires and 30 more on a new set. If you extend the thing, they're going to start slowing in. Hopefully, they can get some new tires on and, and have a little bit more speed than the rest of the guys when they come back out. Gant had jumped up to second spot. He's away 12 excellent. and a half seconds. You can't beat that. That's, That's excellent time. Great pit stop. Meanwhile, Bill Elliott is moving up in the field, and now Elliott slows. Looks like he'll be on pit road this time by. He's in the back of the field. Report is Terry Labonte will pit in two laps. He's now the runaway leader. He's way out ahead of Darrell Waltrip. Here's Bobby Allison on pit road, the Miller American Buick. Robert Yates, the engine builder, Robin Pemberton, the crew chief. Gary Nelson's the team manager. They've computerized stock car racing. They run a pit computer to help them compute gas mileage and how the car should be set up for the duration of the race. Right side tires going on Allison's car. You see the time in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. They use air impact wrenches, not the ones in your local corner garage, and travel at an impressive speed to mount tires in 12 to 13 seconds. 
This will definitely spread out the field. Here comes Labonte. He's back to the start finish line and across. He is 1.6 seconds ahead of Darrell Waltrip. And Waltrip's about to be caught down in turn number one. Bill Elliott comes to pit road, and this is the man everyone's been trying to beat all season long. The Coors Melling Ford Thunderbird comes to a halt. Ernie and Dan Elliott go to work for the car owned by Harry Melling. Again, it's right side tires and gasoline. They're also going in the window, Mike. They're working on that shifter. They're going to put one of these rubber bungee cords around the roll bars in the car to the shifter, hopefully to hold the car in high gear. 15.3 seconds. He lost two and a half seconds to Harry Gant on pit road. Tim Richmond comes flying onto pit road in the old Milwaukee Pontiac. Richmond at 27. We'll get service from Barry Dotson and the Raymond Beetle crew. This has really spread the field out. Cale Yarbrough, meanwhile, has caught Waltrip in the backstretch. But they have only five laps left in which to make this pit stop. Again, it's right side tires. Look at Barry Dotson cranking again, trying to stack that car a little differently. And Richmond is away. The leader is on pit road. Terry Labonte, the defending Winston Cup champion, native of Corpus Christi, Texas. Short track racer there, attracted the attention of Louisiana oil man Billy Hagan. Labonte's on pit road, and so too is Ricky Rudd. Bob Heiss is on pit road. Bob? Okay, Terry Labonte's in the pits. They're doing a quick change of those right side tires, getting a little bit of fuel, not a full can, and he's away very quickly. Back to you, Mike. Mark at 13.2 seconds on Labonte. You see him pass Ricky Rudd on pit road. Like what I noticed on this deal, Harry Gant was the first guy to make that pit stop, and he's out a good bit in front of Labonte. The few tires might have worked good for him like that. Here's Cale Yarbrough, the Hardys Ford Thunderbird. Waddell Wilson and crew, Joey Knuckles you saw earlier on camera, they're over the wall to service Cale. Brings that car to a stop. They're under the car, and they've got those lugs undone almost before the car stops. The watch running. And the other car is running at 160 miles an hour. Uh oh, a little miscue there. It's really something like that. It's really expensive, too, because what people need to realize, you look, relate to this time, each second is almost a football field. When that clock's clicking, you got an awful lot of work on that racetrack to make it up. Simultaneously, Dale Earnhardt has made his pit stop in the Wrangler car. Richard Childress and Kirk Shelbardine serviced it. Here comes the Junior Johnson machine. Jeff Hammond comes around with a jack. Larry Newber is there. are being changed. This is Darrell Waltrip, the only man who's been able to keep up. Today, a relatively routine stop for Darrell. He changed right side tires, just like everybody else did. Got himself a drink of fuel. But the big question is, who put the most in? Who put the most smallest amount in? Well, only time will tell. We'll see how the fuel situation holds out as this race wears on. Benny Parsons Copenhagen Chevrolet has also been serviced. And the leader is Harry Gant. Left side of your screen. At the 30 lap mark, there were four lead changes among two drivers, Waltrip and Labonte. We've been green flag ever since they dropped the first one here in the Winston. 70 laps, 105 miles is the race distance. Mike, they went, there was a lot of strategy played there. Harry Gant was the very first man down pit road. He got to take the hot tires off, the cool tires on. He's leading this thing by as big a margin as anyone has all day long. That little bit of strategy might pay off for him. Now, Labonte stopped later. His tires will be a little cooler than Gantz right now. Should he be able to close up? Well, that's what happens on these things, Mike. It doesn't take but just a couple of laps for the temperature to come up. It's going to be a matter if his tires go away early or if he can maintain that pace here in early run Gantz down. After pit stops, Gantz has a 2.8 second lead on Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip and Cale Yarborough at the top of your screen are second and third. As he rounds off turn four, Bobby Allison's the fourth place car. Tim Richmond is fifth. Sixth is Ricky Rudd. Seventh is Dale Earnhardt. Bill Elliott is eighth. Ninth is Benny Parsons. Tenth, Richard Petty. I think this pit stop might have been a, been a mistake for the Fords, really. It, as you notice, before they hadn't made the pit stops, Kale was beginning to get hooked up, beginning to come up through there. That's the Ford characteristic. When the track gets slick, the car comes from behind, it comes up through there. Now with the Chevys on new tires and the Fords on new tires that are pretty Four equal cars here. They're staying pretty much the same distance, so uh, it could have been a could have been a bad deal for the Fords. In that rundown, let's add Ricky Rudd. He's running in the seventh position behind Tim Richmond. And Harry Gant cruises around. There's Gant, native of Tennesville, North Carolina, where he owns a steakhouse. Pretty good one at that. If he wins this race today, he can buy everybody in town steak. He certainly can. In Harry Gant's pit. Johnny Hayes is standing by. Travis Carter, you seem to be running good. What's the story? 
Well, he's running good if we just hold on, John. Do you have any game plan? You ready? You going for it right now? It's all up to him now. We've made the pit stop. Uh, he's in front in a position. If he could just run and, and not let him close up on him and not try to abuse his tires, he knows who's behind him. He can see Terry in the mirror. Just hold a good pace so they can be consistent. I think we've got a good chance. Travis Carter told me last night, you better watch that Skull Bandit. I guess we better watch him. Kyle Gann has opened up a lead now, 3.2 seconds. He's stretching out on the body. Harry's car really looks like it's working good. You'll notice Harry's car, and, and uh, he can really go in the corner hot. He can stay on the bottom of the racetrack. All the other guys, they pitted, they made changes, but they're still not able to run on the bottom of the racetrack like Harry. I've never seen a car stick through one and two after running that, that many laps on a set of tires. The car is really hooked up right now. He showed us that Mike could qualify for the World 600. He had the fastest Chevrolet here in qualifying. He did the very same thing he ran in the bottom of that racetrack. Evidently, they've got a good chassis combination. They're working on a so slick racetrack. Gant will start his 200th career Winston Cup race on Sunday at the World 600. He's finished 50% of his races in the top 10. He has seven victories, including three last year at Pocono, Pennsylvania, Darlington, South Carolina, and Dover, Delaware. Here's Terry Labonte, the Winston Cup stock car champion, the defending champion of this circuit. Certainly had his best season ever in 1984. Drives for Louisiana oil man Billy Hagan on the Winston Cup circuit. And Ian Hagan share a Chevrolet Camaro in the IMSA Camel GT Racing Series. That's the second place car. Gantz the leader. Labonte rides second. Waltrip is third. Yarborough's Ford is fourth. Allison is fifth. Tim Richmond rides in the sixth spot. Seventh is Ricky Rudd. Eighth is Dale Earnhardt. Ninth is Bill Elliott. Tenth is Benny Parsons. And eleventh is Richard Petty. We'll be right back with more of the Winston. 45 of the 70 laps are completed here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Here's the leaderboard, of course. As quickly as we put it up, it changes. Gantz the leader, Waltrip's now second, Labonte's third, Yarborough's fourth, Allison and Richmond are side by side for the fifth spot. Darrell Waltrip came up and just motored around Terry Labonte. Right around on the outside up there in that one particular place he was earlier. And he just seems to have him a little place up there on the top. And the deal now is can he close in on the leader here again? Waltrip is car number 11, the junior Johnson owned Chevrolet, prepared up in Engel Hollow, North Carolina. Labonte right behind him now lives in Archdale, North Carolina. Corpus Christi, Texas is his home. And they are second and third. Can't these cars get together and draft and chase down here again? I don't know. At some place like Daytona or Talladega, maybe so. Here, the draft's not that important or not as, as big a factor. If you'll watch the cars when they go in the corner and maybe they run two separate lines, that hurts the car when they run two separate lines. Through one and two, Darrell will run real high. Terry runs low. Through three and four, Darrell runs low and Terry runs high. So the cars are not really working with each other enough to be able to hook up in a draft like you would see at a Daytona or a Talladega and run the 33 car down. There's the leader, Terry, Le or excuse me, Harry Gant. And you saw the separation between Gant and the second place car, Waltrip, just coming into view at the bottom of the screen. Let's go to Bob Heiss on Pit Road. I'm with uh, I'm with Dale Emmon, Terry Labonte's crew chief. Dale, he slipped back to third. You got a money lap coming in. Are you trying to save it for the end of the race? No, I think we're back too far now for that. Uh, he says the motor's not pulling quite as good as what it was. I don't know, but he ran an awful good lap that last time, so maybe we'll get back to click here in a few minutes, you know. A lot of pressure on all of them out there, of course, in here on S2, and we got about 18 laps to go here, but uh, it'll be hard catching Harry, it looks like. What's the strategy now? Well, we're running just as hard as we can go. There ain't no question about that. Okay. Thank you. That's Neil, there's not much strategy from here on out. You've made your pit stop, and if the race stays green all the way, there's only one strategy. After that last pit stop, you can might as well reach over and turn the radios off. That pit crew is not going to be very beneficial. Bill Elliott and Dale Earnhardt just got together, coming down the front straightaway, trying to chase back for position in the back of the field. Here's the fifth place battle, and it involves Tim Richmond and Bobby Allison. Richmond's Pontiac, Allison's Buick, battling along in the back straightaway. They're fifth and sixth. Ricky Rudd is seventh. Earnhardt and Elliott are discussing eighth position. They're discussing it with their fenders, so to speak, in the back straightaway. That's nice. Discussion was 3,700 pounds a piece, so they're on equal ground. <laughs> You're watching Tim Richmond in the Pontiac trying to hold off the Buick of Bobby Allison. That's back in fifth position. Richmond running way up high in the groove. Allison down low, but the car looks a little bound up like he's just not getting through the turn. Let's look now at Dale Earnhardt and Bill Elliott. They have separated their scuffle by about a car length or two. They're back in eighth and ninth positions. 
you'll watch these guys and they'll race. Elliott tried him for three or four laps, heated up his tires on the inside. He had to drop back in, maybe run a lap behind or hard, get his tires cooled back down, and then I'm sure he'll make another try towards him before the end of the race is up. Harry Gap is the first man on pit road, and you're watching the Chevrolet owned by Hal Needham, stuntman turned director, and Hollywood actor Burt Reynolds. Evidently, they made a, a proper chassis change or the set of tires they put on was better, whatever the circumstances. Harry was running third when they pitted, he's now leaving. There's the interval, first to second. Gant at the bottom of your screen, Labonte at top. And back at eighth position, there's Walter. Back at eighth position, that battle is rejoined once again. Earnhardt and Elliott. We'll see you in a moment. There's leader Harry Gant. Harry Gant just took that $10,000 again for lead left. 55, and uh, I think he's looking at that big 200,000 instead of the 10,000 right now. Could be $210,000 for Harry Gant this afternoon. This lap, uh, that $10,000 lap wasn't as exciting as the first one, but uh, it pays the same no matter where you're at. Harry's really just running his own race, setting his own pace. He's out there not abusing these tires. The car's still working just great. And uh, well, here's the, here they are racing again, like I said before, for, for that position right there. The nine car dropped back, let his tire cool off. Got back running at him a couple more times, and here he is trying him again. Now, as they run side by side, Bernhard on the right, Elliott on the left. You see Benny Parsons closing in. That's the race for eight spot. Let's go to Johnny Hayes. Travis Carter, you just won 10,000 big ones. How's it going? Well, we got 10,000. We're really rooting for that 200,000. What are we going to do with that money? Way Darrell Walton's coming in. I don't know if it'll be ours. He's coming off the close pass. 10 4. Okay. Thank you, Travis Carter. Back up to you, Mike. We'll be right back with more of the 1985 Winston after this word from your local station. Harry Gant leads Darrell Walter by 2.2 seconds. Terry Labonte is third. Cale Yarborough fourth. The first board. Tim Richmond's Pontiac. Bobby Allison's Buick. That's the front five. Every Winston Cup champion since 1971 is in this way in this race, but only one will take home $200,000. Here's the man with the best chance to do it right now, Harry Gant. But that lead that a lap ago was 2.2 seconds. Darrell Waltrip is running him down. He's cut it down by a tenth or so this time by. I'll tell you what, Harry has looked flawless from the time he took the lead after the pit stops, but just the last few laps, he's been smoking the rear tires off the corner a little bit. Darrell is gradually closing in on him, but there's not but like 10 laps to go, so it's going to be interesting. Waltrip is taking a very high line through the corners and to the bottom of the racetrack. It, he seems to be making good time. You know, you can't fault a guy when you say, well, he's not running in the groove, but he's making excellent time. The only problem is, like Neil said, there's 10 laps to go, and not only does Darrell have to catch him, Darrell's got to get around him. But uh, the way he's been running and the groove he's running, the way he's closing it up, it's going to be close. Two seconds is the margin from Harry Gant back to Darrell Waltrip, but back in third, way back in third, is Terry Labonte, Cale Yarborough's fourth. Tim Richmond now the fifth place car. Sixth is Bobby Allison. Back in seventh is Ricky Rudd. Back in eighth is Bill Elliott. Ninth is Benny Parsons. Tenth is Dale Earnhardt. Eleventh is Richard Petty. We talked to Junior Johnson about Darrell Waltrip's chances to win the Winston. Well, I think in a hundred mile days like that, we got a better chance at Bill than we would have in, in 600 miles because and they won't be enough pit stops. If he happened not to hit the right combination right off the bat, he ain't gonna be able to stop and adjust his chassis and make the preparation changes that he's gonna need to do. And you got a shot at him in that condition. Kyle Petty, that's exactly what happened. Elliott apparently missed on the right combination to win this race. He missed on the combination right off the bat. Whether the car was popping out of gear, the car is still right now is not handling like it has all week long. And you know, it, it's like we said in the beginning, you got one shot at making it, and that, that was that pit stop. And uh, you know, if you're gonna pay a guy on what he's worth in that pit stop right there, Travis Carter just won that 200,000 or close to it. In fairness to Bill Elliott, his concern this weekend may be more on the World 600 Sunday, where he has a chance to win the Winston Million. He'd win the third of the big four of NASCAR stock car racing in one season. He won the Daytona 500, he won the Winston 500 at Talladega. If he wins the World 600 Sunday, he gets a million dollar bonus. Bill Elliott is not the man to watch here right now. It is Darrell Waltrip. Here's Waltrip, top of your screen, and he is eating up Harry Gant's lead. I'm telling you, Mike, he's just now getting to the place on the racetrack, the distance away. A few more laps, he's going to feel that drought to see if he can close it up some. Darrell Waltrip, way high in the corner, coming off turn number two once again. Gant running low on the groove. 
back straight away. There's Terry Labonte. He's the third place car. He's running by his lonesome. Cale Yarborough will have to eat up 1.6 seconds to catch Labonte and take over third spot. One advantage that Daryl really got working for him is that Harry's driving his rear end off, and he can look in the mirror. He sees Daryl coming. He gets on the gas a little bit sooner. He spins those tires. He heats them up. And, you know, Daryl's just driving his own race right now, eating up the racetrack, using whatever he needs. He's not having to catch any traffic. He's just kind of using his time, and he's catching up with him. Here's Cale Yarbrough, the fourth place car, and probably along with Neil Bonnet, the fellow that people on pit road was rated as the best guy to win a one lap heat race for a lot of money. Well, I'll tell you what, it's fun to get under these kind of scrambles uh, with this much money on the line. And uh, right now, I'll tell you what, Harry Gant seeing that Budweiser sounding in front of that little Chevrolet. Gant and Waltrip. Further back in the pack, the two Fords do battle. Ricky Rudd goes around the outside of Bill Elliott, both in Ford Thunderbirds. Rudd drives for veteran crew chief and car builder Bud Moore, who's been with Ford since the glory days, the factory days of the early 60s. Elliott, relatively new racing team. They didn't even come full time to the Winston Cup circuit since 1982. This year, they're the dominant factor. And they battle back in the pack. Four laps to go. It'll be three this time by. And off turn number four come the two leaders. Darryl, Waltrip, well, he is eating it up. Daryl's really eating it up. And, uh, you know, you get down to two or three laps left in the race, and they're coming up to lap Richard Petty here. I, th I don't figure they will before the end of the race, but if they get close to him, he could be a factor in the race where he hasn't been all day long. But, uh, you know, the way Daryl's car is really working high right now, he can go in a whole lot hotter, eat up a whole lot more of the racetrack, and come off the corner strong. He's really running a great track race today. Eight-tenths of a second. About seven miles, two and a half laps, will decide the winner of $200,000. Gantz, lead is gone. Yes, sir, Mike, if you'll watch, you'll see smoke off the rear tires of Harry Gantz's car right here. He's having to work his car awful hard, and Darrell's running on a different place on the racetrack, so I don't feel like Gantz can hold him back there running two separate places. NASCAR's winningest driver in 1984, Darrell Waltrip, seven victories. It's between these two. Waltrip cuts to the outside. That's the groove he's driven since this race started. Gant is on the bottom of the racetrack. It will be a drag race down the back straightaway. I tell you what, this thing, all the money's on the line, and Darrell's car is working on that particular part of the track. It's an asset to him right now. It looks like he's going to be the man working on the money. Waltrip jumped into turn number three with the lead. Darrell Kinder holding two to go. It'll be white flag this time by. They have eight seconds. Back to the third place car, Terry Labonte, and Labonte may lose third before it's over. Cale Yarbrough is closing in on Labonte. Turn one for the final time. Waltrip will climb up the racetrack. Gant has the short way around on the bottom side. Waltrip points it down the back straightaway at Richard Petty's STP Pontiac. That will be a lap down if they catch him. Don't think they will. They go into turn three. Has Harry Gant got anything left? Darrell seems to have something left. And Unless such, Harry does something spectacular in his car, and Harry's car got a little loose off that corner, Darrell's going to come across the line here winning. Darrell Waltrip, a hand in the air, a wave to the crowd of 100,000 plus. He wins $200,000, and up. he blows up. Going in the first corner, he blew up. What a Hollywood ending. Oh, I tell you what, Junior Johnson will be glad to throw that in the garbage can. Junior Johnson and his crew up in Ingle Hollow, North Carolina, built Waltrip a 105 lap hand grenade. Here's Bill Elliott leading Ricky Rudd across the stripe, back in the pack. That's for seventh place. And there's Junior Johnson in the red shirt and the graying hair. He shows little emotion, whether it's victory lane or his car falls out of the race, but you can bet he's a proud and happy man. I tell you what, Mike, I've driven for the man for two years, and he's the most forgiven man when you make a mistake, and when you win races, he comes over and congratulates you. He's an easygoing guy. It's fun to race with him. Larry Newber is with Junior Johnson. Well, this is Junior Johnson being interviewed by a throng of reporters himself down here. His driver, of course, Darrell Waltrip, trying to limp around the racetrack after building that 105-lap hand grenade as Mike joy so ac accurately called it a lot of excitement down here in the pits for the last few laps there was a lot of silence junior did you really think that daryl was going to be able to pull it off say like five laps from the end well we put wedge in the car and we put the spoiler up on it and we knew if, if harry didn't take on some bite and stuff we was going to come on in the later stages so uh it did just what we thought it would well, you guys were a little quiet throughout most of this race, but when the white flag and then the checker flag flew, you really showed your emotion. This was an important one, wasn't it? Well, you know, when you're running for $200,000, there's a whole lot of difference from running from 30 or 40. You know, I'm not sure, June. You may have to go all the way around to the backstretch to collect your driver. I think the engine blew in the first turn of the last lap. Well, he come coasting in here, and the guys was pushing to the winner's circle, so 
uh, we can push it the rest of the way. Why don't you go over there and join in the celebration, Junior, and congratulations. Mike, I tell you what, Junior and the guys worked awful hard building that race car. The motor guys did an excellent job. I'll guarantee you all those little pieces that blew out that thing, they'll be glad to throw it away. They did a heck of a job to pull this off. I uh, sacrificed a $20,000 motor to win 200 grand. Pretty good little investment, I'd say. Darrell Walter, at the age of 38, he's been Winston Cup champion twice. We'll take a look at where he went by Harry Gant to win the Winston down at turn number one. If you look at him right here, he goes in the corner high. Harry run his groove low. What Harry had been doing is going low right here through the middle of the corner, letting the car work up off the corner back out to the wall. Right here, Darrell Walter takes Harry Gant's groove away, and he just blows right by him. And he had to jump off the back straightaway to put him away. That was one of the last few times that old motor took that heartbeat before it went out, but it was doing the job then. <laughs> Waltrip goes into the corner to put Gann away, drop down to the inside, and Harry, whose car had not had a chance to work at the top of the racetrack, he kept it low all day. Fishtail just a bit coming off the fourth corner there, as he did on the final lap, and Waltrip drives home to win $200,000. We'll go down to the winner's circle. Daryl Waltrip will be there with Bob Heiss, and the fans are just kind of shaking their heads. It's a typical NASCAR stock car finish, a thriller, and we'll go to victory lane and Bob Heiss. All right, we're here with the winner of the first Winston, Daryl Waltrip, and is he ever excited? Daryl, what a... <laughs> Talk about excitement. Oh, God, I can't believe it. The car was a little loose to start with. The motor blew right when I took the checker. It blew all to pieces. I couldn't believe I called Harry, though. I didn't think I'd make it. You really put on a show in those last few laps. Did you think you could catch him to begin with? Oh, I never thought I could. I just tried hard, and Junior kept talking to him on the radio. He says, what do you want, 200 or 75? And I went after the 200. $200,000. What are you going to do with all that? Well, that's going to make up for a lot of heartaches we've had already this year. And uh, I'm just so excited. And I want to thank Budweiser and, and everybody that, that's involved with our car, Goodyear, and Chevrolet. And what a great win. Just a great win. Did they make any adjustments in that middle uh, pit stop? Two tires and about a foot of wedge. And that fixed it right up. I'd like to thank God for a safe race, too, and for riding with me. Darrell, congratulations. You're going to the record books as the first one. <laughs> Dang, I love it. <laughs> and that's Vic Lane and Darrell Waltrip. When luck is riding on your shoulder. <laughs> we'll take a look again as Darrell Waltrip takes the checkered flag in the Winston. Coast down to turn number one on the cool off lap. When you run one of these things all day at 8,000 RPM and it's all cranked right up, you suddenly crack the throttle. If you'll notice, Darrell had that left hand out the window. I'm sure he pulled it back in there and got kind of busy because when that motor went off where he's at down here, he had a handful of race car. But uh, like I say right there, you, you brought up a nice point, Mike. You're supposed to tear these motors down after the race. If they inspect that one, they're going to have to go down to the first turn and pick up the pieces. That one's torn up. Never mind, tear down. And behind him, there's Harry Gantz saying, oh, no, why now? Why not one lap earlier? What a throng in victory lane. Jerry Long, the president of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco, the originator of the Winston, discussing the victory with Darrell Waltrip. We'll have a chance to talk with some of the fellows who didn't get to go to victory lane, like Harry Gant. He's with Johnny Hayes. Harry, you had a super run, man. I thought you had him covered all the way. What happened right at the end? Well, the tires just went away, Johnny. The first set of tires were really super good, and uh, they were just really coming in good. And then we decided to change early to give us a, a bigger, quick advantage to have us out in open. But the way it turned out, we was, you know, way out in open. But the set they put on never did... Uh, really react good on the car it just kept the car in an awful loose feeling to finally just you know i was trying not to run any harder than i had to when i was out front and uh, save the tires and turn but the last six or eight laps you know I, I, it just got impossible to go on them well guys you ran super and i'll tell you the skull bandit was flying all day and i guess you were excited about tomorrow yeah i hope the car tomorrow runs as good as this one you know whole, the whole skull team they've done a good job getting two cars ready here we had two cars to run equally the same and uh, just our misfortune day, we just need a couple more laps, and we just run out of tires. And, uh, and uh, Daryl drove a good race, so he come from way back. And it, sometimes that's pretty discouraging for somebody to be that far ahead, you know. And I knew I was going to have to probably race him at the last, because it seemed like for a while I was holding him on, and then all of a sudden, you know, he started really catching me. Well, the neat thing about it, you won more money than you won all year. So you, I know you love money a lot. So uh, go out and spend it happy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Back up to you. Good run. Terry Labonte was one. Terry Labonte was one driver that led this race. He didn't get to victory lane. He did pick up one of those bonus awards, and he is standing by with Larry Newber. Terry, at the beginning of this race, I think you guys had the hot setup. 
Well, we really did. Uh, the car was working super. You know, it just ran great. Uh, the guys just did a fantastic job setting it up for us. The engine ran super. Uh, we ran good. We, you know, we led the money lap and all. And, and I came in the pits, and when I left the pits, uh, I left off pretty hard, and I think I might have revved the engine just a little too much. It might have broke some valve springs or something because when I got back out on the racetrack, the, the thing just didn't run like it had been, and it, it, you know, it lost a couple of hundred RPM. So uh, that's the way it goes, I guess. You know, a lot of people who are watching this broadcast don't see that many stock car races. They probably find it hard to believe that such a little thing as over revving the engine as you recovered from pit stop might have made the difference today. Well, it, it was either that or something else has happened to it. You know, I really don't know, but uh, I know I did bump the rev limiter, and uh, uh, from that point on, it just didn't really run the way it had been. Let's talk one one quick comment about that money lap. You guys obviously knew what lap that was, and you went for it, didn't you? You always know when the money lap is. <laughs> okay, Terry Labonte knew where he was all day today, but it just wasn't quick enough. With another story in the post-race of this, the richest race in terms of dollars per mile uh, from in, for NASCAR, we were going to go to Bob Heiss, but now we understand back up to Mike Joy. Darrell Waltrip wins by three-tenths of a second and wins $200,000. We'll be right back with a recap and more of the inaugural running of the Winston right after this word from your local station. Darrell Waltrip wins the inaugural Winston and the $200,000 that go with it. For second place, Harry Gant gets $75,000. His total winning today, $85,000. Terry Labonte takes home $60,000. Cale Yarborough, $40,000. Winnings for Tim Richmond, $30,000. $15,000 for Bobby Allison. He finishes in sixth position. In seventh, disappointing day for Bill Elliott. His day may come Sunday in the World 600. Elliott takes home $13,000. Ricky Rudd finishes in the eighth position. Ninth is Benny Parsons. Tenth is Dale Earnhardt. Eleventh is Richard Petty. And Jeff Bodine ends his day down in the garage area. Johnny Hayes is on pit road with a man that perhaps everybody expected would win this race. Bill, we had uh, not the kind of day I know you hoped for. Uh, what happened out there? Well, the thing started jumping out of gear right from the start, and I mean, it's hard to drive with one hand and do everything you got to do. I know, you know, it's hard to make an excuse about running. You know, we still, Darrell ran a good race, and it's been hard to run with them anyway. You know, it's hard to beat a ham on, you know, in a short sprint race. Let me ask you, a lot of people use their best car today going for 200 grand. Did you save your best car tomorrow? The car's pretty equal. Well, I felt like the car that was best will be run tomorrow. It's hard to say, but I feel like this car is a little better than the other car. Well, that's super. We got a lot of confidence in you, and uh, shake this one off, and let's go get them tomorrow. Well, the thing I is, we'll not go at it another day. Super. Back up to you. Well, that's one thing about auto racing. When the checkered flag falls, nobody remembers who finishes second, but everybody gets to fix on those cars. Think about the next day. That's right. Uh, you know, the, Bill's sitting there with the opportunity to win a million dollars if he can win tomorrow. And uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people pulling for him. And I know myself and some of the other drivers sure would like to spoil his day, but he's got an awful strong race car. There's Daryl and Stevie Waltrip with Jerry Long. Let's go to the garage area and talk to someone who's not quite so happy. Well, Mike, you're absolutely right. This is Benny Parsons. Benny, we talked to him just as the race started. He started last and didn't really finish up in the big money. What do you think? Is it a disappointment, Benny, or kind of a privilege to run in this race? Well, I think. It's, it's both, Larry. It has to be both. It has to be very disappointing to not go up front in a race in, in a race that we had thought about for four or five months and planned on for four or five months not to be able to run up front. You know, it has to be disappointing. But just to be a part of it was a thrill. And I think that the fans here today, I, I've never seen a day like this in stock car racing. It was a great day, all in all. Benny, what about your race cars? Is this just a matter of shrugging your shoulders and the race is over and saying, gosh, I don't know what else we could have done? Or did you guys learn something? Do you know what happened today? Well, I don't think so. Our chassis was not correct. Uh, we changed it on the pit stop and uh, made it worse, actually. So uh, tomorrow, hopefully the car that we have for tomorrow will end up being better. We felt like we had the best car for today, but maybe we're wrong and I hopefully we are tomorrow we'll have a better car but you won tomorrow the world 600 in 1980 and that's sort of the next order of business is to pick up a win here in 1985 so we can get back in this race next year right that's right I don't have a victory so I'm not eligible for Winston in 1986 and it'd be an awfully good place to start the winning spirit here in Charlotte tomorrow well they pick and choose their races Mike Joy and tomorrow is one that they have picked and one that they have won before now the fellow who has won that race before is Neil Bonnet as we look at Daryl and Stevie Waltrip and a very happy Junior Johnson crew. 
You've been to Victory Lane here, and you know how tough it is to go 600 miles at this racetrack. Mike, I won two of these things in a row, and uh, it was kind of deal where I just couldn't believe the competitiveness of the race from time the race starts for 600 full miles, and then never come along and have an easy win. You battle somebody the wire 600 miles, just like you do in a race like this. It's quite a race for us. The average speed of this race, 161 miles an hour. I don't, I don't, don't have a sheet in front of me, but did either of you guys qualify that fast for Sunday's race? I just qualified just a touch over that. Not much over that, that's for sure. Just barely, but that's quite an average. Quite a race. Considering one pit stop involved in it. It certainly is. 105 miles, 70 laps. That's the Winston, and following the Winston, each of the Winston Cup drivers will have a chance to get in a final practice session for the Winston, or for the World 600, excuse me. We'll have a chance to get in some closing comments and vote on the Goodies Headache Award. We'll be right back to the Charlotte Motor Speedway right after this. Sunday, Jefferson Pilot Teleproductions presents live the Coca-Cola World 600. Check your local listings for airtime in your area. As the Winston is concluded, Darrell Waltrip the winner. Let's go back to Pit Road. Okay, this is Bob Heiss in Victory Lane, and I've got a fellow who visited this area earlier today, Tim Richmond, who won the late model sportsman's race. But, Tim, what are you doing back up here now? Well, I don't know. We finished fifth in that race. We improved up from 11th to 5th, and they said come on up here and get some more TV time uh, because of the sportsman race and because of the Winston here. And I was going to have an old Milwaukee, but we got to practice again. You're tired. You've already run two races today. You've got a 600-miler tomorrow. How do you feel? Well, surprisingly, I'm a lot better uh, physically than I thought I might be. I just got to make sure all the kinks and the uh, binds and the muscles are out before tomorrow's race. So I'm feeling good. I'm glad I ran the sports race, obviously, because I won it. But I think it did help because uh, for the Winston race, from going from 11th to 5th, we made a change before the race started. Uh, don't tell anybody because you're not supposed to do that. But we did now. <laughs> We uh, we managed to finish fifth, so congratulations to Daryl, but maybe next year I can get one. Well, you still got some money in your pocket for even showing up. Well, yeah, I mean, thanks to Winston. I mean, $200,000 to Daryl. I think I might have 60000 coming from that. and uh, That ain't hay. No, I, that's for sure. And uh, go to the bank and see where I can spend it uh, somewhere. Maybe go back to Ashland, Ohio, where I'm from, and spend it. Okay, Tim, <laughs> thanks a lot. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Tim won $30,000. Kyle Petty, what kind of race do you look for tomorrow, quickly? Well, you know, this was a real fast race. And, and like, like Neil had said before, you know, we think they, they could have thrown the gears to the Chevys and, and made it a fast race. And it's obvious that Darrell's wouldn't have lasted much longer. But uh, I don't think you'll see that fast a pace tomorrow. You know, it, they'll slow it down. They'll back it off a little bit. And, uh, you know, the track's going to get slick. It's going to be the same type deal. And the guy who hangs on and hits the right handling combination is really going to work. Well, thanks for joining us and representing the Ford viewpoint on today's telecast. We'll look for the 711 Ford of the Wood Brothers, car number seven tomorrow. Neil Bonnet, how about your view on tomorrow's World 600 from the Chevrolet cockpit? Well, we felt like today there's going to be a lot of gears pulled in the cars to, to make up that difference maybe in handling with the Ford products. Tomorrow, that option's not going to be there. That luxury's going to be gone. We're going to have to pull something conservatively and uh, hope that it'll go 600 miles. So I think we'll see a different type race tomorrow. Hopefully, we'll see virtually the same outcome with a Budweiser car in Victory Lane, but maybe it'll be mine. Can you get Junior's crew to stop celebrating long enough to get your car set up for tomorrow? We're ready to go. My car is ready before I came up here. I'm ready to ride. Good thing. Uh, we'll let you folks get out of your final practice session. We'll join Larry Newber. Well, Jeff Bodine got into this race as kind of a surprise, Jeff. You surprised a lot of the people last year by showing up as one of the really top teams, winning a couple races, getting in. But today, too short, wasn't it? It was too short. We were hoping to run the whole race. It, it would have given us a, a better feel of what was going to happen tomorrow. Uh, for the time we were in there, the car felt real good. It ran good, handled well. But with, it was just too short. Uh, we broke the very end off the valve, uh, an intake valve, and of course that messed the whole engine up. And we had to pull in. You know, the two sportsman cars really performed well in their race. You had to be thinking, wow, this must be my day too. Well, it looked like it might be a Levi Garrett day. Uh, I didn't run a sportsman race, so I would be better prepared for this Winston. As it turned out, I told Rick Hendrick, our car owner, I should have run a sportsman race because the Winston was awful short. But I'm glad for Tim and especially glad for my brother, Brett. Uh, his first time ever on a speedway, his first time ever in a super speedway late model car, the first time here at Charlotte, and to run fourth against the people he ran against, to do the kind of job, uh, professional job, just use his head all day long. He deserves a special award, and I'm going to, I think, take him out to dinner just to show how much I appreciate and uh, enjoyed what he did. 
Well, Jeff, you've been very close so far this year to winning that first Grand National race and getting into the Winston for next year. What's the difference? What's going to make the difference? What's going to push you over the edge from second to first? Well, in this business, you need a lot of luck. You know, we've been pretty lucky. We finished all our races this year, and we're second in the point standings. That's great. We feel good about that, very happy. But we just haven't had enough luck to win that race. We ran strong against Bill Elliott last week at Dover. Possibly could have won that race. Had an ignition problem. We, we had sort of the same problem in Atlanta against Bill Elliott. Ran second to him there. We've been close, but we just haven't been able to put the whole package together on race day. We're going to do that. Our team is getting stronger every week. Well, Mike, accepting Bill Elliott as number one, this guy has got to be first in class so far this year. He's had a great season thus far, Larry, leading the points and really showing strong. And his performance today, perhaps not an indication of what he'd expect tomorrow, certainly in the World 600, but he'll be a little fresher for the experience. The crew chief on the winning car is Jeff Hammond, and he's with Bob Heiss. Yes, he sure is, and he's got a garland of flowers around him, Darrell Waltrip's garland. I know he wanted to give it to you for the kind of car you built for him today. Well, I tell you what, I can't can't say enough about how hard the guys have worked on this car. We spent, believe it or not, almost five and a half months really, you know, preparing for this uh, race. We've done a lot of testing here. Every time we went back to the shop, we worked on the car and kept trying to improve upon it. We got here the first part of the week, you know, we had a little bit of problems with the car, but it just seemed like it came around. And I can't say enough about how much and how proud we are of Daryl because he really put forth a super effort today coming from behind to catch Harry right there on that last lap. And, I mean, it's our first win of the year, and I can't be any more happier than to win to Winston. I mean, Winston's done so much for racing, and it just makes it so such an honor. I mean, it's just, I, you know, I'm just bubbling over right now because it's, it's just been a long time since we've been to Victory Lane. And you had it calculated right down to the finish line. <laughs> I tell you, we, we were had, we had the watches on him. We started out, we were about three seconds behind or four, and we started gaining, but we began to wonder if we had enough laps. And with about two laps to go, we saw if we could just get close enough that at least we maybe could make a photo finish out of it. But Daryl said he didn't want no part of that. And he just went ahead and drove by him and went on. And, you know, thank the good Lord for a good, safe race. And I'm, I'm proud he let us win one today. Well, now you only got to relax for a little while. You got a practice session coming up for the 600 and another race tomorrow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. And uh, I've always called Charlotte kind of like my home. I was born and raised here, and I, I love winning here. So uh, I look forward to maybe come back here again tomorrow and try to you know pick up our second victory of the year. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. Really Jeff, good. congratulations. Thanks. That's Jeff Hammond. Waltrip made up a 3.3 second deficit to win by three tenths of a second. We'll be right back with more of the inaugural Winston after this word from your local station.